contribution to the world of Torah literature continued after the Siddur. What was the next major project? <clears throat> next project was the Machser, Roshana Yom Kippur, which uh, is also very, very important because, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Piyutim, Roshana Yom Kippur, are unintelligible. <clears throat> I mean, uh, I, uh, I went through Mepharsh and had to look up the psukim that they're based on. They're, they're very, very poetic. They're very beautiful and very hard to understand. So that was, uh, that was a new challenge. Was it very time-consuming doing that type of research? Did you have to consult with Piyutim experts to understand the, the breadth and no, depth of it? No, there were a few Svarim, not mm-hmm. many. Mm-hmm. There were a few Svarim that deal with the, with the mouse or with the Piyutim. And were you able to borrow some of the basic material from the Siddur and incorporate that into the Mahser? Yeah, much of the Mahser is the regular Siddur. Karbonis, mm-hmm. Pesukah de Zimra, so right. <clears throat> a lot of it comes from the Siddur. The hard part is the uh, things that are exclusively in the Mahser. And again, the Mahser has that, what I would call the iconic introduction that has become mm. synonymous with, yeah. with each of these volumes, and you put a tremendous amount of work into that as well. Overview. The overview. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stick to the, to the yeah. uh, right term. Um, after the Machzor, we're moving into the late 80s. Um, was it the Stone Chumash the next major project? Mm, yeah. How did that idea come about, to do that form of a Chumash? Well, it was a logical next step, because... The, uh, the stone chumash really follows the pattern of the Siddur and the Machser. And uh, there was a need mm-hmm. for that kind of chumash. There was, there was no other chumash like it. And the only thing that approaches the Siddur was the Hertz, the, uh, the chumash rather, the Hertz chumash that uh, the chief rabbi Hertz of Great Britain produced in the 30s, I believe. Mm-hmm. And a really very interesting insight. Somebody showed me an article, a review article about the Hertz Chumash. Yeah. Hertz was a, Hertz was a, was a firm Jew. He was not, he wasn't your reformer conservative rabbi. He was a, a very firm Jew, and he wanted the Chumash to represent what the Mefarshim, what Chazal say. However, he was dealing with a clientele which was, um, I wouldn't say thoroughly assimilated, but to a great deal was, uh, was assimilated. Even, even the Orthodox community in England mm-hmm. was not what we would consider, uh, you know, in, in the 21st century, what we would consider a Teredika community, far from it. <clears throat> and <clears throat> this review article that somebody showed me lambasted him, criticized him, this, he thinks he's writing for an educated, sophisticated public, and he really expects us to believe these stories as if they really happened. So what Rabbi Hertz had to do was to present, present the Chumash and explain it according to the Masorah, but at the same time to, to make it palatable mm-hmm. to these you know, educated Sophisticated right. people, quote unquote. So, so for example, he would quote Matthew Arnold. We can't quote Matthew Arnold. Hmm. We we stick to Chazal. Right. And I think the Hertz homage is also written in a bit more of a complex type of lingo that that the everyday that was, man may not understand. Yeah, that was the intellectual yeah. English language of. Uh, of Great Britain in the 1930s. Exactly, and it's not the, the vernacular. Same way, so. The same way that the, the, the Hirsch Chumash mm-hmm. is Hochdeutsch. Right. Even in Germany, it was an intellectual brand of, um, of German. Right. And I would say also, that later on, the Sansino Gemara, I think, also had that issue, where it was not language that, that everyday English speakers spoke. True. So the Stone Chumash definitely broke new ground in that sense, bringing a commentary and a translation that's understandable. Uh, You did not choose to translate Rashi, though you did obviously include the Chumash text, Unklus, and 
and, 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 and Rashi, Rashi's commentary. And, and one other thing, which is very important. <clears throat> what, what translation do you use? What do you do if, if the Ramban or Sforno or Ibn Ezra don't go with Rashi? Right. Whose translation do you use? And we consulted on that. Or Ramirez, Mayor spoke to Reb Marsha, Reb Marsha Feinstein is Rebbe. I spoke to Reb Yankiv, and there was absolute agreement by everybody. Chumash means Chumash Rashi. So the translation follows Rashi, even even where others have something that fits the words better. Mm -hmm. But we we stick with Rashi. And then on the bottom, you bring in the on commentary. The bottom, yes, the commentary. So all the mafarshim. Mm -hmm. And what's unique to the stone Chumash, and I wonder whose idea that was, was that at the end of every Parsha, there's a commentary or a comment from Reb David Feinstein regarding the number of mm -hmm. Sukkim in each Parsha, which is very unique. Mm -hmm. How did that come about, that addition? <clears throat> well, Mayer was very, very close to Reb David. Right. They were in Yeshiva together. Reb David was quite a bit older, but it's like, you know, like, like an older brother, but they were very, very close. And he knew that Reb David always had something on the, the, the number of the psukim in the parasha, and he thought it would be a nice idea to, to include it. So Reb David gave us the material. And it really does add a, a, a unique flavor at the end of every parasha right. that I know I appreciate it and I'm sure many others mm -hmm. do. Reb David has an amazing original mind. Reb David, for example, Reb David says a chumashir every Arab Shabbos. Sure. I think half hour, 45 minutes. He never quotes anybody. It's all original. David is uh, a low-key kind of person, but um, he's come to be recognized in America as the God Ladar. Yeah, absolutely. We're definitely fortunate that we have a God like Reb David uh, guiding Klai Yisrael, but specifically guiding Art School. He's been a, he's, a, a, a father figure Always Art, so. available whenever we needed something. He's always available. Uh, Mayor and he used to speak on the phone every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally every day, not, not Shabbos. <laughs> but, uh, and he was always available. We had, we had a question, we needed guidance. He was, always, he was always available. The feedback to the Chumash was fast and coming as well. Sold very, very well. And what specific feedback have you gotten over the years to the Stone Chumash, which is really mm -hmm. unrivaled? It came out, what, uh, if I'm correct, about 30 years since its release? Or about, yes, almost, about almost. 30 years ago. About 30 years, and there's really been nothing like it. What feedback have you heard? You spoke about the Siddur impacting people's lives, becoming Bali Tshuva. What have you heard about the Chumash? It's very interesting. I got comments from, uh, from, from rabbis, comments from Rabbonim, Talmidei Chachamim, and from people with uh, no Jewish background. Everybody finds something in that Chumash that appealed to them. And that was the design, that was the idea, the same idea that we have with the Siddur. Make the Chumash, first of all, make it comprehensible. Explain it. And the translation It has to be faithful to the, to the words, mm -hmm. but as much as possible, make it, make it a translation that can be readable on its own, even without commentary. And teach people, have them understand some basic concepts, and inspire people. Like we get into, for example, um, well, in, in Mayer's Chumash, there are extensive overviews in every parasha. I think the uh, on whole Sefer Bracious, there must be at least 30 overviews, maybe more. In the, uh, in the Chumash, we have, we have an overview that introduces Tereshev Iksav. That stands on its own. And then, for example, Avram is tested. What's the definition of a test? What's the purpose of a test? HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows. He knows what somebody would do or somebody would do, could fail to do. What's the, what's the idea? What does it mean? Carbon. What, why, 
How does, how does slaughtering an animal bring you closer to God? What, what is it telling you? What does it mean? Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, so many concepts. And such basic concepts. We're talking about basic, fundamentals of, like, of Yiddishkeit. Basic concepts. And in the Chumash, we, we try to explain them in just a few paragraphs. Which is quite daunting. Uh, it's, as a writer, it's harder to write something concisely than to write it you know, mm. uh, in a lengthier That's fashion. That's right. It's, it's a challenge. But when you're finished, it's a, it feels good. <laughs> Sure. Now, this project was a, was a wide-ranging project. Do you remember how long it took you to complete it? And were you still writing longhand Again, at the time? Yes, I was still writing longhand. And um, again, it's hard to say how long it took because, because for much of the time I was doing the Chumash along with other things. Mm -hmm. So it was never full time. But we felt, Mayor and I felt that... Um, you know, Mary has a, had a, had a, used to have a favorite saying that uh, Ravina and Ravashi were the ones who put the final touches on the Gemara, on, on Talmud Bavli. He said, uh, Ravina said to Ravashi, there's a, there's a deadline, we have to finish. <laughs> <laughs> so we had, uh, we, 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 had a, we had a deadline, we had promised it by a certain time. So for, for about a year and a half or so, I worked from home, locked myself in the house. And that was as a means of, of uh, maximum to give productivity. A, give it maximum time and maximum intensity, maximum concentration. During that period, I would come into the office one day a week, sometimes, sometimes twice a week. But uh, that was, I don't know, a year, at least a year, probably a year and a half or so. Now you're talking about locking yourself in a room and really immersing yourself in this Avedas HaKadosh. Mm -hmm. I have to ask, they say there's no great man without a, a great woman behind him. And I'm sure that in your case, it would not have been possible to do what you, you've done and continue to do without a, a supportive family. And you referenced your Rebetzin before. Talk about how your commitment to art scroll affected the home front and how you were able to balance the two. Well, you're right. Nothing like this can happen without, um, without a very good wife. And my wife is more than very good. She was tremendous balas chesed in her own right. She helped countless people. Even, even now, she's gone almost eight years, even now I have people from that I meet, or my children meet, and they said how they were faced with a question, a dilemma, and they read about her. They didn't, some of them knew her personally. Most had just read about her. And they said, what would Mrs. Sherman do? And that's what they would do. Can I give you an example? Yeah, absolutely. There was, um, there was a woman in Borough Park. <clears throat> she was physically handicapped because she, had, she was once badly injured and did not have use of one arm. And it affected her mentally also. She lived alone in a basement. She had a cat. She couldn't, she couldn't take care of her personal hygiene. There are a lot of no, Nashim Sidkanius and Klal Yisrael, they would bring her food. They would shop for her. She needed something. They would not come into the, into the room because it smelled. And you had the cat. And cats don't flush the toilet. And my wife used to go into her and take her laundry and when she had to go to the hospital, she said, I can't go to the hospital. Who's going to take care of the cat? And my wife said, I'll take care of the cat. I'll come in and feed the cat. My wife hated cats. She did it. The laundry she did in the laundromat, she didn't want to put it in our washing machine. Mm -hmm. So why am I telling you this as an example? Um, I got a letter several months ago 
from a woman in Muncie who had no idea who it is, never heard of her. She signed it, but I never heard of her. And she said she had a similar situation where she was asked to take care of someone and, and it was very unpleasant. And she didn't want to do it. And then she thought, what would Mrs. Sherman do? And she did it. So, you know, if, if you need a wife who's going to help you, even when you have to concentrate on your work, and, um, and sometimes you get home very, very late. Mm -hmm. Baruch Hashem, I had it. There were probably sacrifices made, but uh, I think it would be fair to say that the accomplishments that we see are definitely credit to her. Yeah, she was. And uh, together, together, you and your Rebbe was able to raise a, a beautiful, beautiful family. family, Baruch Hashem, of children, uh, great uh, grandchildren, great grandchildren, yeah. who are who are in Acha, So it's definitely uh, it's definitely a tribute to her, as you mentioned. <laughs> Rosh I tell you, I was about to kill you, and she davened in Chaim Berlin. She liked the yeshiva she davened, and uh, during the break, she would say till him that the tekiya should be good. <laughs> That's called the devoted wife, right? <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> Going back to projects, we referenced the Stone Chumash as a, as a monumental achievement. As you moved into the 90s, what were the projects on your table? And as Art Scroll undertook probably its biggest project, which was the Schoenstein edition, what was your role in guiding that project and uh, you know, weighing in on important decisions as mm. that project made its way through Masechte after Masechte. I had almost no role in the, uh, in the Shatnerstein Talmud. During the consultations, you know, whenever I was needed, I would be, I would be available. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the, the editors would, would send me something to look over and maybe it should be rewritten to make it more, more palatable. How do you explain mm -hmm. something? <clears throat> but um, those were limited occasions. What do you think, and how were you impacted by the Schottenstein Gemara when it first came out, and it really took the Torah world by storm? There well, had never been a translation let me, like let that. Me, let me give you some background. <laughs> um, uh, Mayor and I became close to Rabbi Yankov. We would consult with him. Give you, oh, I, I mentioned before, Chumash is Chumash Rashi. When we were doing Shira Shirin, how do you explain Shira Shirin? You know, on a, a literal translation, it's just... Uh, it's uh, allegory, it's, it, allegorically. It's, it's erotic. Right. How do you... So we went to Rabbi Yankiv, and Rabbi Yankiv said, Shirashirim is a marshal. To translate Shirashirim literally falsifies Shirashirim. That's not what it means. So he said, take one of the Mepharshim, uh, preferably Rashi, but not necessarily, and translate it according to that, according to the allegory. So if you read our translation of Shir Hashirim, it's not at all literal. It, it's, it, it explains the psukim with the, uh, with the nimshal, mm -hmm. but the message rather than, the, than the strictly the words. The, um, so as I said, we used to consult with Bianca all the time. And at one point he said, and when will you do the shas? And we laughed, you know, we thought he was joking, we do the shas, we do the shas. He was very serious. I remember word for word what he said. He said, ihr kennt das ton, und ihr darf das ton, und ihr wett das ton, aber ihr wisst mir et mir schenken jorin, aber ich schreibe mal brief. He said, you can do it, and you should do it, and you will do it. And if and if Hakadosh Baruch Hu gives me the years, I'll write you a letter. Um, he did not have the years. We started doing it six years after that, and he mm -hmm. was already he was already gone. But um, that you know, when we it gave us a lot of encouragement, we still felt that that it was too much, that we mm -hmm. too too great a project for us. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later how we were able to finance it. That's a story mm -hmm. in itself. Right. But um, 
At first we thought, show you how, how, how naive we were. <laughs> At first we thought, there are people saying very good, popular Dafyami Shiurim. So we'll get, we'll, we'll get tapes. In those days it was tapes. Right. In those days we'll get uh, tapes of the Shiurim and we'll have them transcribed. And then we'll do a little bit of editing and we'll, and we'll print it. No. Did you oh, try no. You tried well, it? We tried it. And it's, it was obviously, it was impossible. No, it would, it would never, never, never work. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, one of the great brochas, the Siata Dishmaya, that the Rabbani Shalom somehow, somehow gave us treasures, literally treasures. And this particular treasure was called Herschel Goldworm. Herschel Goldworm was brilliant. We were in yeshiva together. At Beis Medrashalyum? At Beis Medrashalyum. And, um, and he, had a, he, he had a position uh, teaching 8th grade, in the, uh, 12th grade rather, in the yeshiva. And he was a magnificent rabbi. He knew everything. And he, could, he knew how to teach. Talmudim loved him. The yeshiva folded. And he was left without, without Parnassah. His father-in-law was in the diamond business, so he went, he was selling diamonds, but uh, he was not a diamond salesman. <laughs> and at that time, we needed, we needed someone. We were thinking of doing Sefer Doniel, because we were doing Svarim of Tanakh. Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, I have this friend, and he can do it. And if his English is probably not up to par, so I'll edit him. So we brought him in. It was breath of fresh air. It, like, it, it, it was like sunshine. He knew everything. He was the Yerei Shemayim, Echsidi Shayid, and Onov, available for it, and made nothing of himself. Purely purely service to the Rabbi Shalom, service to Klal Yisrael, service to anybody who needed help. So when it came to the Gemara, he was the, oh, he, he was involved in Mishnayis also, especially the more difficult. Uh, That's Masechus. the, the Yad Avram series. Right, right the original, the original Mishnayis, Yad Avram. <clears throat> so when we came to Gemara, he was the logical one to set the tone for the project, mm -hmm. which he did. The style of the Gemara has uh, evolved a little bit over the years, but basically, basically it's with him. And that's credit to him. Yeah. Credit to him. And uh, I'll give you one small example. The first, the first Masech that we did was Masech to Makas. And uh, there's a Reb Kiva Eger, interesting Reb Kiva Eger in the beginning of Makas. And they asked me to write it up, which I did. And I fitted it into the commentary. And Herschel said, Herschel said, it's very nice, and it's probably correct, but we're not here to say our own chidushim. We're here to explain the Gemara according to Rashi. And that was the pattern from the beginning. And that was the style that the Schoenstein edition continued. Gemara with Rashi. Mm. Of course, there's and, more. And, and there's more, obviously. Right. much more. For, I mean, for example, right. uh, you know, Rabbi Yashiv said, Sal used our Gemara. He went through the notes of our Hebrew Gemara preparing mm -hmm. for his shir. Right. Rabbi Yashiv did not need us to tell him what Rashi says. Right. So the fact that the, the notes are so, so clear and bring up so many other points for further research, mm -hmm. if Rabbi Yashiv felt it was important, and how do I know that he felt it was important? He first he told us, all right, he's a nice man. Maybe he wanted to make us feel good. No, uh, uh, uh. His grandson once called up. He said, he's, he'll, soon he'll be starting to share on Bechiris. And could we, could we send him the volume? It wasn't written yet. Wow. He said, well, you probably have galleys. It wasn't written yet. Mm -hmm. So if Rav Yashiv had his grandson request the chayrus, that means, that means that he wanted to use it. 
No question. Um, you mentioned Rev Goldworm, who tragically passed away in, a, in his 50s. 56. 56. 56 years of I age. I believe it was 1993. Uh, and I know that only because he, his name is mentioned in every Shanstein Gemara, and rightfully so, yes. as, the, as the pioneer of the project. But he was followed by many outstanding Tamid Chachamim over the years mm -hmm. that you've gotten to know and uh, have become part of the art school family. Talk about that development of the Tamid Chachamim and their contribution, not only to the Gemara, but to the subsequent projects. <clears throat> well, um, at yeah, two levels, the yeah, writers and editors, and Rabbi Cheskel Danziger, who's an uh, outstanding Talmud Chacham, <clears throat> he, um, he, he worked with Rabbi Herschel. He was very devoted to Rabbi Herschel. <laughs> Someone once, when we did Karchim, uh, somebody said to him, did you go to Brisk? No. Yeah. He said, he didn't go to Brisk, so how could you? <laughs> so he said, my rabbi in Karchim is somebody that if the Beis Hamikdash would be built tomorrow, he could he would tell the Kainim what to do. <laughs> that was Herschel. Oh really? He was talking about Herschel. Anyway, he's um, he he oversees the editors and makes sure that the the style is pretty is consistent mm -hmm. throughout. He's done a lot of writing himself, and a and lot of it is a unique thing that the Shanstein edition. Not only are the Masechtas written by separate people, but within the same Masechta, the Prakim are divided up just because mm -hmm. of the yeoman's job that it is to mm -hmm. elucidate it. And exactly. yet, as you just alluded to, the translation is pretty much uniform in terms of the flavor of the writing. And, uh, and, and the, that's definitely a and unique And the commentary, the elucidation, it all, yeah. <clears throat> it, it, it all fits into the pattern. <clears throat> and sometimes you have writers, they tell me to chachamim, and they want to... Put in more, and you know, he has to discipline them. You know, this or you're like Herschel from the start. This belongs. This doesn't belong. And the Hebrew Gemara, the problem was even greater because these are real, very, very solid Talmud Chachamim, and uh, many of them, maybe even most of them, want to say their own, and they have what to say. Right. And uh, and uh, Rabbi Cheskel, disciplines them, he trains them. Training is the right word. He actually trains them in how to present something and what to present and what does not belong here. So that's the, the there you have two levels. You have the writers, the editors, and then you have you have Yecheskel over them. Mm -hmm. And since then, uh, Ali Hertzka is in that, uh, in that league and uh, Zabi Meisel's in that league. And then and then you have what, what we call the readers. These are Talmud Chachamim of Rabbi Herschel's caliber. <clears throat> and, and, and their function is to, to twofold. First of all, if editors have a question, they have a problem, they can call them, they can discuss it with them. <laughs> so they provide guidance. <clears throat> and and they, re they read the finished project, the pro finished project, rather, and, um, and they pass on it for correctness, for accuracy, and they'll send back notes, <clears throat> they'll ask for corrections. And that, we call them the super editors, readers, mm -hmm. super editors. There was um, Rabbi Malinowitz, who's tragically nifter just uh, about two years ago. A Talmud Chacham who could work 28 hours a day on several different projects. He can work at different Masechtas and he can work at Mishnahis. And, and, and he was available for everything and thorough. And I, I don't know when he ever slept. Plus, plus he was, he would throw himself into a project. He would do more than he was asked to do. Well, we miss him. But Baruch yeah. Hashem, there are other people who were able to pick up the slack, but... Uh, you know, he was like, like a partial category of his own. Then there was Rabbi Mordechai Marcus, exceptional, exceptional Talmud Chacham. And um, he was also one of these, uh, one of the readers. 
he's, he had to stop the last couple of years of his life. He wasn't able to do it anymore, and he's not, not here anymore. <clears throat> and then we have uh, Rabbi Saul Sim Cheshur, a son of Rabbi Gedal Yeshur, who was an Eloi and a Goen in his own right, <clears throat> contemporary and a good friend of uh, Herschel, Rosh Hashiv and Rosh so that's the that that that's our that's our team. That's the team that put together the Bavli, the Yerushalmi, the Hebrew, the English. And you're talking about this team of Talmud Rachamim and editors and super editors and proofreaders, mm -hmm. all outstanding Talmud Rachamim. You see, and and you and you need something else. You need something else. You need a combination of skills that is very very hard to find. It's it's really it's rare. You need someone. You need someone whose English is good. It doesn't have to be excellent, but it has to be good. You know, editing is one thing. Not rewrite. Mm -hmm. It has to be someone whose, whose language is good. It can be improved, but it has to be good to start off with. It has to be a Talmud Chacham. If you don't know how to learn a piece of Gemara and learn it well, then you, you can't be writing the Schattenstein Talmud. So you need a Talmud Chacham whose English is very good. Difficult combination to find. And you need a third talent. He has to be a teacher. He has to know how to explain. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to explain it so that, you know, Reb Chaim Brisk, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik in Brisk, he used to say that if he, if he can't explain his Chiddush to the wagon driver mm -hmm. and make him understand it, then, then it can't be correct. If it's correct, you can you, you have to be able to explain it in a, in a in a simple fashion so that everybody can understand it. Now, some gemaras are very very complicated. You know, yes, not yet, not everybody can just pick it up and read it the way you'll read um, I don't know uh, the Reader's Digest or something like that. But they have to be able to explain something like. Like a Rebbe explaining something to a class on the level of the class so that they can understand it. Mm -hmm. So a triple whammy. Language, Lamdas, Talmud Chacham, and teacher. Very hard to find that combination. And it is interesting that the final product is something that could be understood by the layman, but is also appreciated by, by Rebbe Yashiv. By Rebbe Yashiv, by G'day and that uh, that combination is definitely rare. But I want to go back to the Talmud HaChacham, and we're talking about a virtual kailo that Art School mm. put together, mm. and you mentioned before about hey, the Rebbe fundraising. Rebbe Moshe used to say, and Rebbe Meir liked this, he always repeated it, huh. a kailo on vent, huh. a kailo without walls, because they're not all in the same base matter. Right. Absolutely, and these Talmud HaChachamim across the world, both in Eretz Yisrael and here in the United States, are working on behalf of Art Scroll, and that's quite a costly endeavor. So the idea came about to establish a foundation to pay for the research of the mm -hmm. projects. Talk <clears throat> about that, <clears throat> I'll tell the introduction you how that of that idea. I'll tell you how that happened. So when we were still in our Small original building on Coney Island Avenue. 1969 Coney Island <laughs> Avenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, 1969 Coney Island Avenue. Next to Nino's restaurant and across the street from a gas station. <laughs> and uh, somebody came in. Me, Mayor and I worked on the second floor. Somebody came in. He said to a receptionist, um, he would like to meet the principals. All right, come up. He's, he came to say thank you because um, he said he's been learning the, the Mishnah and he appreciates it, he's gone through the whole thing, just came to say thank you. And how do you do this? Well, it turned out his name was Joel Fleischman. At that time, he was the, he was the first senior vice president of Duke University. And Duke, uh, according to current ratings, is the, the fifth best university in the United States. <clears throat> and he was, 
he was a professor, and in addition, the first senior vice president. You know, it's not a, that's not a small position. Anyway, he asked us, well, how, how do you produce such work? And we said, with long hours and, uh, and sometimes borrowing. And he said, he said, look, he said, I've been at Yale and I'm at Duke. You cannot produce such work without a tax-exempt foundation because it is very expensive. And he volunteered. He, uh, he enlisted the tax attorney of Duke, uh, not a Jew, and together they would set up a foundation and walk it through the IRS, and make sure that it's impeccable. You know, foundation can be arts grow. Arts grow. Masara Publications cannot take uh, tax exempt money. We're a business. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, <laughs> maybe it's not the most successful business in the world, but we're a business. To be tax exempt, you have to be a legitimate charity. And he worked it out. There's an arm's length relationship between the, between Masara Publications and Masara Heritage Foundation. Most people don't understand that. Yeah, many people don't. Many people have asked me, what's ArtsGrow? What's Masara? What's the foundation? Why do you need it? And that's why it's important to explain. People mm -hmm. should understand. All right, so well, so. So while you brought it up, let me explain it. <laughs> the, same way for, the same way, for example, you have, let's say the Metropolitan Opera. You have the conductor, you have the orchestra, you have the singers. They all get paid. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know what tickets cost, but they're not cheap. That's a business. The Metropolitan Opera is, is a business. But they have to raise money because ticket sales don't pay. Mm -hmm. In the same way that the sales of the, of the Arts School Gemara will never, never pay for the, for the amount of work that, that goes into it. Um, so there's a foundation that raises money, and they contribute to the, to, to the opera. But the, the conductor has nothing to do, he, the conductor does not get paid by the foundation. Mm -hmm. That is that, the, the, the same thing here. There's, I'll give you an example of the Gemara. The Gemara, each, each volume of the Gemara cost between two hundred and fifty and three hundred thousand dollars to put out. Because we pay writers and editors, we pay them. Mm -hmm. We're not, uh, they're not on welfare. It's got to be a living wage. Yeah, they, don't, they don't get food stamps. As a matter of principle, mm -hmm. we feel that it's wrong. You can't take someone and, 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 and pay him like, a, like an indentured servant who's getting, a, who's getting an allowance from Tati. <clears throat> Sales don't cover that. Right. Sales don't cover that. One of the things that Joel Fleischman noticed was he said, at that time, uh, there was no Gemara yet, but there was the, the Yad of Ram Mishnayis. He said, and Ram Mishnayis, and that cost in the middle 20s. He said, a college, he said, I've been at Yale and I've been at Duke. A college textbook of this quality mm -hmm. would go for 80 to $100. That was his question. How do you do it? Mm -hmm. How do you do this at such a moderate cost? Right. So the price of the Gemara you know, people would like to get it for ten dollars a volume, but the price is still subsidized to make it affordable. You can't do that unless you raise money. <clears throat> so that's what that's what he set up the foundation. <clears throat> now we have the foundation. Now the trustees of the foundation is Joel himself, uh, Jim Tish, who's the chairman of Lowe's Corp. Uh, Joe Schenker <coughs> was a Talmud of mine in the fifth grade. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I'm Schenker. He's the chair. He's the chairman of Sullivan and Cromwell, which is one of the biggest law firms in the world. Uh -huh. You know, these are people of very, very high caliber, and, and the others as well. And Rivdova Feinstein mm -hmm. as well. And is on the board of trustees. <clears throat> 
these people, these people are not going to be involved in something unless, unless the books are audited and unless, unless everything is done in the up and up. You know, they're not uh, some, somebody like, well, like Joel or Jim Tish or, uh, or, or, uh, or Josh Anker. They're not, going to let, they, they're not going to let their reputations be jeopardized. So they're on top of it. They know everything that's going on. We have meetings twice a year, and, uh, and they want to know what's happening. And uh, a, a reputable accounting firm does audits. One of the top accounting firms in the country. So it really is arm's length. The foundation raises the money. Well, the foundation doesn't raise any money, really. Mayor raised the money, now Gidali raised the money. Mm -hmm. But the money goes to the, to the foundation. And the foundation, these trustees, decide how it should be spent. So that supports the editorial work, not the business end of it, right. <clears throat> the editorial work. And then it's turned over to Masora Publications, and we get it ready for print and we sell it to the stores. Right. Now that you're talking about the financial stability brought, around, brought about by the foundation. But we've heard and read about the financial instability of Art Scroll in the early days and the sacrifices that you, Rabbi Zlotowitz, and Rabbi Brander had to make to bring Art Scroll to where it is today. Take us back to that time of such mm. uncertainty when you didn't know what the end you didn't know the end of the story <laughs> no. yet. Those early years were no, were no fun. A lot of times we had to borrow to make payrolls. And for many, many years, even until recent years, we, we borrowed large sums of money over Pesach and over Sukkot when we're not doing any business. We're closed right. to, to make sure that everybody's paid. We, we never missed a payroll. Never. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a cuddle without wolves, but we pay more reliably than the cuddle <laughs> with wolves. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there were loans. We, we both... We both took at home equity loans, which really? Wolfen plowed into the business wow. to keep things going. And uh, there are people who were very generous lending, lending us money, and, and everybody was paid back in time mm -hmm. until it reached a point where Baruch Hashem. But um, and getting, getting back to financing the, the Talmud and other projects as well. You know, once, once Joel Fleischman had set up the, uh, the foundation, we were able to raise money tax deductible. Like Harvard. You know, you, you, you make contributions. Harvard has an endowment of, I think, over $300 billion. Maybe it's $3 billion, I don't know what it is. But it's, it's, <laughs> it's in a lot the of billions. <laughs> it's in the billions. And Harvard is a charity, right. you know? So once we were able to do that, we were able to, uh, to get people to try and, and dedicate a Masechta. The first one, Marcus, was dedicated by Marcus Katz, Mexico City. And then after, we started with Marcus because it was a one-volume Masechta, mm -hmm. a yeshiva Masechta. So it's something that's widely learned. And uh, yeshiva boys learn it. Parents would, want, would be interested in, in learning and using it to help them learn with their children. That was the first one. And Baruch Hashem, it, it, uh, it succeeded. The next one we did was Erevin. Because we were hoping to finish Erevin in time for the upcoming Daf Yomi. And... Um, and that was written by Rabbi Yisrael Reisman, correct? He's, right. He elucidated it. Yeah, he, yeah. he did. Uh, later on, it was upgraded, but he, mm -hmm. he, he's the one who wrote Erevin. And um, our good friend Rafi Butler, who at the time was the, uh, was the director of the OU, he introduced us to Jerome Schottenstein, Jay's father. And he undertook, he dedicated volume one of Erevin. We hadn't finished volume one yet. We ran out of money. So what do we do? 
Now, the mayor had a friend named Nachum Stillerman. He was a, an executive director of institutions. He understood fundraising. So he said, you go back to Schattenstein. <laughs> we got from him already. He said, you don't understand. If somebody trusted you once, then he'll trust you again. You always go back to people who, who trusted you, who helped you. Mm -hmm. So we went to, we, we, we met him, and, uh, and he said, he wrote out the check. And then, and then we, we had the idea of um, getting a name grant for the whole thing. Not just the Schattenstein edition of Masech the Erevin, but the Schattenstein Talmud. And we prepared a proposal, and we went to Columbus. We met with, we met with him in his home, and Jay was there. In the middle of the meeting, Jay went out to Dav Mencha, in the side room, and, uh, and he undertook it. He undertook it. One might say one of the greatest investments any philanthropist has ever made. Jay's mother, Jay's mother at one point said, until now we were merchants, but now they know our name all over the world. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. It's true. In America, it's known, I think, more as the art school Gemara, although everyone knows Schoenstein and Eretz Yisrael. It's all Schottenstein. They're going to his firm, so Kfar Hegea Schottenstein. Right. And it's definitely a tremendous chus. And then they, they've dedicated many other projects and volumes of Talmud, Yerushalmi. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jerome, it's funny, everybody knows they said Jerome. In those days, they called him Jerry. But anyway, <laughs> he was Nebuch. Uh, he got cancer, and he was Nifter after four or five volumes, mm -hmm. not more. <clears throat> and Jay and Jeannie not only kept it up. Remember, we visited, Mayor and I visited... Uh, Jerome in, in Columbus on his deathbed. You know, they set up a, like a mini hospital around his, around his bed, and he said, uh, he said, Jay will do it. He said, Jay will do it. You can trust me. Jay will do it. And Jay and Jeannie, not only did they do that, they did the, the Hebrew Bavli, the English Yerushalmi, the Hebrew Yerushalmi, the interlinear series, uh, and, and, and Jay and Jeannie both say, they say publicly, that uh, they, they give us credit for changing their lives, for bringing them, bringing them close to terror and feeling that they have, they have a share in terror. Maybe we changed their lives. They changed our lives. They changed Klai Yisrael. They changed the lives of Claudius. I mean, just think about it. The last Celestia Mashas, 90,000 people in MetLife Stadium, 20,000 people in Barclay Center. And how many people were, 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 were listening, watching it mm -hmm. on hookups all over the world? Unbelievable. And the growth of Daphne. Could that, could that yeah. have happened without the Schattenstein family? Never. Never. It's an unbelievable accomplishment. And it spawned many other projects because of that, the popularity of the projects that Jay and Jeannie have undertaken. And they're individual dedicators also, of course. Absolutely, who are so vital to the production yeah. of each volume. Now you're talking about, right. we're talking about the Talmud. What would you say, I know this is kind of like a very general question. What, would, what do you say looking back over the last 45 years what has been Art Scroll's greatest contribution, if there is one? I'm not talking about books per se. Art Scroll's greatest contribution has been and continues to be, Baruch Hashem, that it brought countless tens of thousands, maybe even, maybe even a couple hundred thousand, into learning, into appreciating Torah. Mm -hmm. into respecting Torah. This criticism that they had of, of Rabbi Herzl's Chumash, who does he think he's talking to? Educated, sophisticated people. 
educated, sophisticated people now, now, are learning art scrolls for him. They're learning shas. And they reach a point, they reach a point where they can do it on their own and just, just go to art scroll for, uh, you know, to check something if they're not yeah. a... Nav Minsker Rebbe told me, and Reb Chaim, and Reb Chaim Levrocha, and Reb Chaim Levin, Rosh Hashim Shekav, Reb Chaim Levrocha. They, they both told me that uh, without art scroll, they would, not, they would not have been able to learn Daf Yomi because they have so many responsibilities. They would not have had the time to be able to, to learn it in addition to their shiurim and everything else right. that they have to do. And they're not ashamed to say it. Mm -hmm. They're not ashamed. What was the hardest project you ever worked on? The most difficult project? Yeah, it's hard to say. I don't know. I couldn't. Maybe Eov was very hard. Mm -hmm. You know, when I asked Rabbi Brander this question, I asked him, what was the hardest project you, have to, you ever worked on? He told me, there's no hard project. It just means it takes a little longer. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, look, there used to be, there used to be the, the Navy engineers in World War II were called the Seabees. S-E-A-Bs, and their motto was, their motto was, the hard jobs we do right away. The impossible ones takes a little longer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nevi Makarain was also hard because uh, the, the word, that, the, the poetry, mm -hmm. to be able to, to translate it correctly and, and explain it, they're hard. So you, on the Nevi Machronim, you wrote the commentary as well with yeah. the translation. Yeah. And that was also a wide-ranging project. Very hard, but very satisfying. Mm -hmm. It's I, interesting. You know, you, yeah. you just mentioned Rabbi Brander. We, we haven't spoken about him. This project without Rabbi Brander would not be the same. Rabbi Brander is not only, he's not only uh, an expert in graphics. You know, he could, he could be the number one graphics man in, in Random House or Simon & Schuster or any, any company. Mm -hmm. He's a graphics genius. But he's a Talmud Chacham. He says it for many, many years. And, and he has taste. He, when, when, when he's putting a page together, he doesn't just take copy and organize it on a page. He reads it and he makes comments. He's, uh, and, and then he'll do some editing while he's at it also. He's a, he's a genius. Yeah, we see, we see it in the work, and we see how an art scroll volume is immediately recognizable. You open it up, you know it's art scroll. And that, as you alluded to, is, is credit to she is genius. Mm. Why do you, you know, think... If you're, not, if you're yeah. not in graphics yourself, right. you can't appreciate what it takes to put together the page. You have, let's say, the... Uh, Let's say the Chumash page, okay? Chumash, Unklus, Rashi, and Balaturim, Sifsech HaChumim, and you want everything, all of them to be on the page corresponding to the, to the Chumash. The last word of the Targum on the page corresponds to the last word of the Chumash on the page. And if you think that's easy, try it. <laughs> It's impossible, and Shia does it. And Rav Shia told me that the, the genius of such graphics is when you don't notice anything. That it looks so seamless and so obvious that people wonder what's, what's, what's so hard about it. I once saw, well, like I told Rav Chaim before, I said if, if you can't explain it to the, to the wagon driver, to the balagola, then it's not right. Right. I once, I once saw a comment, um, the background music of, uh, of movies. The greatest tribute that you can pay to the, to the composer is that he's not even conscious that there's music. It blends in so well, it sets the, it sets the scene mm -hmm. so well that you, know, you don't even know you're listening to music. Right, absolutely. You, Rabbi Zlatowicz and Rabbi Brander became this, I would call you, the dream team. 
You work together. Mary used to call it, he, he got that, he got that uh, term from um, I think Peggy Noonan, is that writer he wants? A writer, to, yeah. She, had a, she, she entitled a column, The Genius Cluster. <laughs> and Mary used to use that, The Genius Cluster. Himself and she and Rabbi Belinowitz and, uh, and Rabbi Shor and Rabbi Marcus and Cheskel Danziger and, and Herschel Goldworm and now you. <laughs> The genius cluster. <laughs> There's a lot of talent under this roof. Tremendous amount of talent. But, but you and Rabbi Zlotowitz and Rabbi Brander, with humility, uh, were able to work together so I'm well. I'm not humble, I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> and with a sense of humor, <laughs> which is very important <laughs> you know, when you're working under pressure. You know, like somebody once, somebody once said, he's, he's modest? He has a lot to be modest about. <laughs> Precisely. But you worked together as a team, and I'm sure it wasn't always easy, but you, 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 you got along and, and kind of fit together like pieces of a puzzle, mm -hmm. because each of you brought mm -hmm. something else to the table. Speak that's, about that relationship. That's another element that made it, that made it possible to, to succeed. Never any politics, never any backstabbing. We could argue, we could disagree, but... Uh, you disagree because you're you're, you're, trying, you're trying to find the proper solution, and now and, and now Gedalia fits into that scheme personally, per, personally, perfectly. I mean, yeah, and we'll get to that in a moment. I want I wanted to ask you also when Art Scroll, I would call it branched off to do something a little different from what the original outlook or goal was, and that was when you started publishing all Hebrew volumes. It was the Siddur, and then Hamashim, it was, it was a different kind of undertaking because Otsko became known as the translator or the elucidator, but people appreciated the perfection and the beauty, and the all Hebrew volumes have been a tremendous service as well. True. It seemed like the logical next step. You know, many people ask for it. Mm -hmm. They say, you know, they wanted something with the same level of perfection in, in a safer, an old Hebrew safer, that they, that they felt that they were getting in the, in the English works. Right. I don't know if this is a fair question, but is there any particular failure or mistake that you remember that was quite egregious, and, but you learned from it, and you bounced back from it, and you grew from it? Well, we've. I think of one, one particular cipher book. It had a very poetic title. It was a very good book. This goes way back. I don't, I don't, read, I don't even remember the title anymore. But um, it was a flop. Why was it a flop? And we felt, because the title didn't say anything about the cipher. It was like. A nice poetic phrase. You know, we learn from that that you have to uh, you have to have a title and a subtitle that will that that will let the reader have an idea of what it's all about, what what, it, what he might be getting if he decides to buy the book or to read the book. We had. Um, The first Sukkot Masa that we put out had some, had some mistakes. Mm -hmm. It was put under pressure, deadline. It just had some mistakes. And, um, and we told people, we told people, send it back. You'll get, a, you'll, you'll get a free copy. And we put it all into Seamus. It was a huge loss, huge loss. I think as much as, if I remember correctly, something in the area of $80,000. Which at that mm -hmm. time was, was a large sum of money, right? You know what? It still is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but we swallowed it. You know, it, you, you can't, you have no right, you have no right to, to, give, the, to, to give people Torah or Tefillah, which is not correct. Give you an example. 
not necessarily something that we learn from, although you could say we learn from it. In the beginning, in the early years, we were doing Sefer Yoyna. After the five Megillas, it seemed like you know, a logical thing, you know, a short Sefer. It's, uh, everybody knows Mafter Yoyna and Yom Kippur. And uh, Mayor had a good friend who was very, very knowledgeable in, uh, in, in Kisve Kodesh. In later years, he became a professor of Jewish studies at a certain university. And, and he was writing. And, um, and Mayor was, you know, he was reading. He says in one place, he said, Rashi made a mistake. Rashi made a mistake? Who were you to say that Rashi made a mistake? <clears throat> so we paid him. We paid him, took the project away from him, and started from scratch. <laughs> Literally from scratch, from Pasuk Aleph. That was, it was a matter of principle. You know, that's, that gives you a good idea of what, uh, what Mayor Zlotowicz was all about. He was a businessman. Yes, he was. <clears throat> you know, you can't do things unless you can, unless you can pay the bills. But he was a man of very, very high principle. Could have made a lot more money doing other things. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be a Marbitz Torah and to do it correctly. Tell you another thing also, and this, is, this, this, this goes back to the, to the very beginning, and it's very important. <clears throat> the, um, we, don't, we don't refer to, to any non-Orthodox sources. Not, not, not Gentiles and not, not so-called Bible scholars. We're here to tell people what the Torah says as, as the Chazal understood it and as, as, as the, the Rishonim and Achreinim understood it. That's it. And uh, more modern people or what you might call progressive or worse, have criticized it for it. Mm -hmm. There was, um, in the early years, there was a magazine called Moment, still exists? Moment magazine. I don't know, but I've heard of it. I don't know. And Moment magazine was, uh, you know, a magazine of, of, of Jewish interest. It was, uh, they tried to, to, prop, to uh, pattern themselves after commentary, but only in Jewish subjects. And they did an article on Art Scroll. Well, half of the article, half of the article was criticizing us for our translation of Shira Shirim. It's a love song. And they don't present it. You know, they, they, they falsify Shira Shirim. Half of the, half of the article. <laughs> Marvin Schick who was a good friend and a really outstanding, outstanding person. Marvin told me, he says, that article is trash. They're criticizing you. You say, you, you, you say from the outset, you say that we're presenting it according to Chazal. And they want you to present it as, a, as an erotic love song. They're the ones who are not honest. You're honest. You said what you're doing. We, we, don't need, we, we don't need Bible scholars to tell us that the word of Hashem is correct. Hmm. You know, there's, there's an old story. Uh, somebody's, somebody's being taken on a tour of the, the Louvre, the famous museum, and he's looking at the, uh, he's looking at the, the Mona Lisa and he's criticizing it. And this is, he says, uh, and the tour guide said, he said, when you look at the Mona Lisa, you're not criticizing the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is criticizing you. <laughs> you know, if people feel that, uh, people feel that this is not, this doesn't take into consideration modern philosophy and modern kfira and modern Bible criticism and archeology, span they don't, they don't get it. They don't get it. We're presenting Torah. And they're presenting the Bible, they're presenting literature. 
we're presenting Torah. Two right, different you, things. You were never trying to be all things to all people. No. Exactly no. the opposite. Because when you try to be all things to all people, you really no things to any to people. Anyone. Right. And that, and that was Reb Mayer's credo. It's been now several years since the Art School family lost Reb Mayer. Three you years. lost a dear friend. And it's, it's, it's probably been a difficult, uh, a difficult time without him. But Klal Yisrael blessed us here in Art School with, with Reb Gedalia's Lodowitz. And talk about that transition and how Reb Gedalia has stepped in so valiantly and capably to mm. continue to grow mm. Art School. And the truth is, the truth is that there was no transition. No transition whatsoever. Mayor Gedalia has been with us, I, mean, I don't remember when he started, over 20 years, maybe 25 years. I, I, I'm, I'm not good at those things. <clears throat> and, um, and Mayor worked with him. And he was, he was privy to everything that was going on. So when that tragic moment came, he was, he was ready to step into, into his father's shoes. He's done a magnificent job. We see it in the products you that are coming out. You see it in the out. product, and, and, you, yeah. and, and you see it if you, could, if, if you could see the way the team works together. Mm -hmm. No politics, no backstabbing. You know, he's, we, we let him know from the start, and it didn't even have to be said, it was obvious. We're here, we're here to make sure that he succeeds. And he's succeeding. Yeah, when you walk through the halls here, you feel that unity, the common sense of purpose, the lack of ego, uh, I think it's tangible. And I, I think also uh, there's an energy here. You know, we're, we're located mm -hmm. right next to the bindery for the viewers who don't know. We're all in one building here, Art School Studio, the editing department, the sales department, and then we have a bindery here where books are being produced literally 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. And uh, that's, that's quite an amazing experience. Just talk about that for a moment. You started on Coney Island Avenue, moved later to Second Avenue, now here in Rahway, New Jersey, to a state of, uh, of the art facility and being able to print on demand and, and that whole uh, evolution <clears throat> and development. Well, we started, when we started out, we didn't do our own binding right. and not our own printing. Mayor was always opposed to doing our own printing because, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes the job is not, is not good. Sometimes there's somebody goofs in the print that doesn't work out. He said, if you're doing your own printing, you're stuck with it. If you're, if you're contracting your printing out, if it doesn't live up to specifications, you refuse the job. And, and every, every, every printer knows that. You know, they, sometimes they have to swallow a job and do it over again. Now, now we do printing because uh, the process has evolved and developed and been, been perfected. We used to use, um, we used to use a bindery in, in Goshen, New York, upstate. And, um, and then we decided we, we had to do our own binding. <coughs> so the, we, we, had, we, we took space in a building in um, the outskirts of Borough Park, 36th Street and um, 14th Avenue, an industrial building. And, and, and we hired somebody who had been a, a career binder, a, a square a chassid. But he, was, uh, he grew up as a binder. And we, um, and we brought in Phil Martino, with a name like Phil Martino, obviously he's a nice, good Italian boy, also a genius in the, in the bindery business. His father was, uh, was in binding and he's in binding. And, um, and eventually Phil managed that bindery. Hmm. We ran out of space. We ran out of space in, in our headquarters. A little building and a little two-story in, ba two in basement attached, actually, storefront building originally. <clears throat> and something became available. This is an amazing story. 
a building became available on 44th and 2nd Avenue. 2nd Avenue in Brooklyn, be, a full block between 44th and 45th. And it was an old building. It used to be an ink factory. And somebody took it over. They wanted to use that as a warehouse. And he decided uh, not to do it. He didn't bother paying his taxes. And the city was taking it over. And it became available. We had, we had to come up with $930,000 within 30 days. And we could get that building. We didn't have $930 in the bank after meeting a payroll. <laughs> I, had been, I had been learning with uh, Larry Tisch, who was the, the chairman of Lowe's Corp, and his sons. And this started uh, in my, my, first, my first year in art school after I left, after I left Stone and Yeshiva. A friend of mine called, and he said uh, his brother-in-law does business with, the, with Lowe's Corp. And Larry Tisch said that he's, he's interested in this Torah. What is it all about? He's a, he, he, never, he never learned Aleph Bez. Hmm. He was a, a, a devout Jew, not the Jewish religion, but for the cause of Israel, Jewish life, Jewish philanthropy. He was really an, an amazing person. And this fellow, he's called, he's called his brother-in-law, he called me because you know I wasn't I didn't I didn't have to keep hours. It was more or less a free agent of working for art school, but you know my schedule is flexible. But I come so I started coming to the office once a week, an hour a week, and it was Larry and uh, his his son Jim and uh, son Tom and, the, and another son. And we, we, we became very, very close, became very, very friendly. <clears throat> so when this building came up, $930,000, so I, I went to Larry and I told him, okay. So he wrote out a check for $930,000. No, no contract, no IOU. And of course we paid him back. And we got the building, and it, it was a shell. It was a shell. Squatters were living there. People had, had to turn out the, uh, the, the pipes, the plumbing. <clears throat> so we had to build it from scratch. And in Baruch Hashem, we were able to get, uh, able to get loans, financing. And that became our headquarters. We were there for well, over 30 years. Right. And then we were able to bring the bindery into our premises. So that was in the basement. No, not a basement, first floor. Mm -hmm. And, um, and as, as the company grew and as we were doing more books, we needed, we needed more machinery. We kept buying more and more. And eventually it, just, it became too small. We bought the adjoining mm -hmm. building and, um, and opened, up the, opened up the wall. And we're still too small. So we knew that we would have to move. And um, so we had a couple of agents, you know, look for, pro for possible properties. Couldn't be in New York, because real estate in New York is too expensive. And they found something in New Brunswick, which were almost ready to buy, and, uh, and the seller backed out. And then this premises came along. It was a Mamasha Hashkocha. This magnificent building, huge, huge building. This, this was a Regina Vacuum Cleaner Company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a major vacuum cleaner company. And they were put out of business by China, mm -hmm. like many other businesses. During, the, during World War II, it was converted, converted into a defense factory, making, uh, making things for the army. Like, ma like many big companies in America, General Motors stopped making cars. They were making... Mm -hmm. Tanks and who knows what else. Anyway, so uh, we sold the Second Avenue property, and that and that was enough for the, to buy this property and fix it up. And here we are. There was one 
one revolutionary product that's made a very big difference called POD, printing on demand. It was invented, oh, maybe 10 years ago, it was fairly recently, mm -hmm. where you can, uh, you, you, you can print as many books as you want. You see, in, in, the, in the printing, the publishing industry, a lot of time is taking up setting up the machine for the, to, for, for the project. And then and that can take hours. And, and a, a printing company has to charge you for those hours. You know, you're not, uh, so the only way to make it economical to, to, to print a book is to print 2,000 copies. Mm -hmm. 1,000 copies, it costs you a lot more. Mm -hmm. Less than 1,000 copies is prohibitive. And you don't always need so many copies. What do you need? So you, yeah, you, have a, you have a book that came out five or 10 years ago. It sells, let's say, 200 copies a year. So you're going to print 1,000 copies and store, mm -hmm. store 800 copies for, for four, four or five years. Right. It's, a, it's a huge financial load. When you're printing on demand, you can print, you can print 100, you can print 50, mm -hmm. you can print 200. So we, we bought, I think we started out with two machines. Well, that was really she is uh, she managed that she a brander. You know he's a genius in a lot of things. He's a genius in that too. And um, and there were bugs. It was a new product, but eventually the uh, the manufacturers perfected it, and we bought a couple more. There was no room on Second Avenue for all this. Right. So here we are, and here we have to, I think we have six machines, or maybe even eight machines. And most of the time, they're running 24 hours a day. Right. And the quality is good enough. It's art school quantity. Now, Mayor Zlotowicz would not, would not sell a book if it was not top quality. He Absolutely. would not do it. And Gedali is the same way. But here, Baruch Hashem. And you, you, have, you have books that come out, and they're as good as the outside product. So when you, when you need a, a large run of a book, so then we, we have a, a broker who's, who's been working with us for many, many years, and he does it. He has his companies that he works with. Or we'll have some things done in China. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you, if you want something done in China, you have to be, has to be ready four to six weeks before well, you get it to the market. And it takes time until you get it back. Whereas right. here, we can, we can do a POD book and bind it the same day, and the next day deliver it to the stores. Yeah. Yeah, it's a game changer. Game changer. Definitely. It's been an incredible experience speaking to you, and before we end, if it's appropriate, I want to thank you personally, because when... What did I do now? <laughs> when, when I was able to join Art School, and I got to meet with you, uh, you couldn't be more gracious, more encouraging, more supportive, um, great guidance and really, really heartfelt encouragement, more credit mm. than I deserved. And mm. I want to thank you for that. It was very and meaningful. You know, I'm part of the genius cluster. I could tell that you were what we needed. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And in, in, a, in a very vul vulnerable moment and a very humbling moment, it meant a lot to hear what you had to say and the kindness and encouragement uh, will stay with me forever. So I thank you for that. And thank you for all you've done for Kla Yisrael as a whole, for enriching us, for inspiring us, for bringing us all closer to the Rabbani Shalom Yishuv Zeicher mm. to continue to do so for many more years. You make me blush, but thank you anyway. <laughs> and thanks again for these uh, couple of hours that we were Zeicher to talk. Yeah. Hatzlacha, all the best. <laughs>